Hello, my name is uh, Jean-Pierre Desprez. I am Scientific Director of the International Chair on Cardio-Metabolic uh, Risk. And I'm joined today uh, by two colleagues at the Quebec Heart and Lung Institute, Dr. Philippe Pibarro, who is the, the head of the research group here on uh, uh, valvular disease, as well as uh, by Dr. Patrick Mathieu, who is uh, a heart surgeon and a, a scientist here also uh, at the research center. So, gentlemen, thank you for joining us uh, today. We know that um, abdominal obesity is associated with metabolic abnormalities, increasing risk of, of uh, coronary heart disease and risk of type 2 uh, diabetes. But today we'll have a, a, a discussion around another type of disease, which is actually quite prevalent and uh, a source of uh, concern. Patrick, you are a heart surgeon. How are heart valve uh, disease uh, important clinically? Yeah. Well, Jean-Pierre, uh, we know that uh, coronary artery disease is uh, quite prevalent uh, in our societies and, uh, uh, and they're still quite prevalent. However, in the last decade or so, there has been an increased number of cases with pa uh, in patients with calcific aortic valve disease. Uh, calcific aortic valve disease is a chronic process of uh, the aortic valve and, as the name implies, it is a progressive thickening of the aortic valve and calcification. And in a matter of years, for some patients and subjects, uh, there will be a development of a stenotic process uh, with the development of the left ventricular hypertrophy. And eventually, when the process is quite severe, patients start to develop symptoms. And uh, as I mentioned, there has been an increased number of cases in the last uh, 10 years or so. And this can be attributed to uh, several factors, uh, the aging of the population, the risk factors that have uh, changed over the last several years. And if we think in terms of prevalence, uh, if we look at the very early step of uh, aortic calcification that we call aortic sclerosis, which is the start uh, the, at the, the beginning of the process in the whole spectrum of the disease, uh, the prevalence may be as high as 20 to 25 percent in patients with diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Um, if we look in terms of aortic stenosis process itself, in a population over 65 years of age, the prevalence may be as high as 2 and 5 percent. So there is a huge number of patients in our aging population with different risk factors that are at risk to develop that disorder. So really, this is not a, a trivial uh, uh, clinical uh, problem. Philippe, you know, you're, you're heading a, a very uh, productive group on uh, valve uh, disease. What do we know uh, about the risk factors? What uh, the, the clinician uh, should uh, pay attention to in terms of predictors of, of progression of the disease? Well, uh, I should say that uh, as opposed to coronary artery disease, we don't know as much. Uh, uh, one of the most, I should say, uh, important risk factor that has been shown in, in most of the valvular diseases, especially aortic stenosis, is age. Uh, clearly, the, the prevalence is increasing dramatically with age, as, uh, as Patrick just mentioned. Uh, and then after, uh, in the past, LDL cholesterol has been associated, obesity, diabetes, uh, and uh, uh, essentially, uh, there are not much factors that have been associated with, with uh, increased uh, prevalence and progression of the disease. And for a long time, interestingly, we thought that valvular heart disease and uh, aortic stenosis was a result of aging, mm -hmm. wear and tear of the valve, fatigue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was a purely passive disease, and therefore if it's a passive disease, the only way to treat that is to, when the, the, the valve becomes stenotic or dysfunctional, is to open the chest of the patient mm -hmm. and, and replace mm -hmm. or repair the valve, which is a major, uh, of course, surgery. And valvular disease are directly responsible for about uh, 100,000 open heart surgery just for North America. Wow. And when you estimate the cost of a open heart surgery, it's between 10,000 to 100,000, depending on complications and which side of the border you are, Canada, US, or other countries. So it's a huge um, health and mm -hmm. socioeconomic burden. So for the primary care physician, you know, the, we, we have uh, trained our primary care physicians to watch for, for hypertension, for dyslipidemia, for diabetes, because they know in asymptomatic 
patients, they are predictors of progression of atherosclerosis, and those are powerful risk factors for development of coronary heart disease. If I understand you well, for, for instance, valvular disease, it's, it's still pretty much a black box, right? It's pretty, pretty much a black box, and I think there is a, a changing uh, uh, paradigm in the sense that, as I, as I said, for a long time it has been thought to be a purely degenerative passive disease. Now, from the work that has been done here and on other institutions, we realize that actually valvular disease, aortic stenosis, is an active disease that involves uh, many similar mechanisms as uh, atherosclerosis with lipid-mediated inflammation, but also some distinctive features. There is an osteoblastic uh, activation mm -hmm. that is very powerful in valvular disease, and, and of course that will lead to the mineralization, to the calcification of the valve, uh, which is of course uh, the, the main uh, key uh, lesion uh, that leads to uh, valvular dysfunction. So uh, uh, I think that in, in this sense, a valvular disease has some common denominator mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with coronary artery disease, but also this is a different disease, and there are some, mm -hmm. some factors that are different and needs to be identified. And a good example for this is the issue of statin, where uh, well, we, we put a lot of hope on statin, saying, ah, this is mm -hmm. since now aortic stenosis is an active disease, this is atherosclerosis, so statin will work. Mm -hmm. And actually, we put lots of I think enthusiasm, hope, and million of dollars on this, and finally, uh, after three main randomized trials, this is a failure. A statin. I guess we'll come back to yeah. the uh, statin uh, issue in a few minutes. Um, Patrick, on your side, could you describe, summarize for us the, the initial work that you and and Philip uh, uh, has conducted, indicating that there was clearly a signal linking also abdominal obesity and metabolic syndrome to, to valve disease and aortic stenosis. Well, Jean-Pierre, uh, we, we started a program about five years ago uh, uh, with Philippe, and uh, we, we started uh, with court studies looking at uh, the risk factors that promote uh, the progression rate of uh, established uh, calcific aortic valve disease. And uh, one uh, advantage of uh, that disease in terms of uh, investigation uh, at least is the fact that uh, we uh, have the lesion at the end of the spectrum. So therefore we can have progressive uh, follow-up of patients with different tools, uh, CD scans to estimate the uh, lipid uh, distribution, the fat distribution, to estimate the degree of calcification of the aortic valve. We can have echocardiographic analysis to document the progression rate of the disease. And when patients start to develop symptoms, they do have a severe process they need a surgery then, and we have the aortic valve for analysis. And that allows us to make correlation mm -hmm. between the findings of the aortic valve, the clinical uh, anthropometric measurements, the different cytokines or adipokines that we measure in blood plasma, and to make uh, mechanistic studies that uh, goes from the patients to uh, the pathological lesions, even eventually to animal models and to go back into the patients. It is really uh, a patient to bench and bench to the patient mm -hmm. approach that we have. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And I guess you, by this, I would say, very comprehensive multidisciplinary program, you have identified some, some signals now, some, some yeah. potential uh, path uh, to yeah. follow, right? Actually, we, uh, we, we, we have identified an association between visceral obesity and, and associated metabolic abnormalities and faster progression of aortic stenosis. So among patients with aortic stenosis, those who have the uh, visceral obesity metabolic syndrome, they, they progress on average two-fold faster compared to the other patient. And this is not only progression as measured by Doppler echocardiography, they also have a higher uh, event rate. And uh, what is interesting also from what we found from our research is that this valvular metabolic risk, if you will, mm -hmm. persists beyond aortic valve replacement. Because in most of the patients, when the, the aortic valve becomes stenotic and the patient becomes symptomatic, we do an open heart surgery to replace the valve. And most of the time, we use a bioprostic valve mm -hmm. that is uh, made of uh, porcine or bovine tissue fixed with glutaraldehyde. And, uh, we found that patients with metabolic syndrome also have faster degeneration of their bioprostic valve. So they, they reproduce yeah. the same disease as they had uh, at, at the stage of the native valve mm -hmm. in their bioprostic valve. Uh, 
also it not only has an impact on the valve, it also has an impact on the ventricle. Uh, there is, if you will, a, a, a metabolic hemodynamic stress interaction here, where you have a patient with a, a aortic stenosis, by definition, has a pressure overload in his uh, ventricle, in her ventricular cavity. And so this, the, there is an additional, uh, an extra hemodynamic burden. And of course, the ventricle of a patient with a unfavorable metabolic profile would eventually uh, deteriorate in terms of geometry and function more rapidly. So there's a lot of uh, metabolic processes actually that are going to uh, contribute to exacerbate the, the condition of the patient if that patient has too much fat stored in the wrong place and uh, this metabolic profile. And as we often uh, uh, discuss, you know, when we refer to those metabolic abnormalities, it's, it's a huge minestrone soup. Mm -hmm. So do you have potential candidates, uh, Patrick, that you're paying attention to in terms of yeah. predictors of uh, disease progression? Yeah, in fact, uh, Jean-Pierre, we, uh, over the last several years, identified, I will say, three uh, major factors that could be involved into uh, the calcification of the aortic valve. First, there is, uh, if we look at the lipid variables per se, and as Philip mentioned, the statins have uh, uh, been uh, negative so far in different trials in order to prevent the progression rate and the calcification of the aortic valve. So in one study, we look at the accumulation of oxidized LDL within the aortic valve. So we do know that oxidized LDL uh, infiltrates the aortic valve, promote calcification of the tissues. And we look at the different lipid variables that could correlate with the amount of oxidized LDL. And we found that the small dense LDL phenotype of particles is certainly uh, the most important factor that correlates with the oxidation of LDL particles. So this could, at least in part, explain the failure of statins, since we do know that statins do have, at best, a modest effect mm -hmm. on uh, the size of LDL particles. So th uh, that is one aspect of, uh, of uh, the metabolic syndrome, ectopic fat accumulation, that could play a role. Second, there is the insulin resistance factor. We do know that insulin resistance is related to calcification of blood vessels of the aortic valve. In patients with uh, calcific aortic valve disease, it is a, a risk factor of progression, as uh, Philip mentioned. And um, uh, among the different factors that could play a role, we recently uh, look at the level of adiponectin. So adiponectin is a nadipokine, which is produced by the fat cells, that play a key role into insulin resistance, mm -hmm. glucose tolerance, and by the way, it is also a, a powerful anti-inflammatory molecule. And we found that in patients with low adiponectin blood levels, there is more aortic valve inflammation and the disease progression rate is also faster. So there is no, so far there, there has been no studies that have demonstrated a cause and effect relationship, but at least there is a strong association that needs further study to look at a possible uh, cause and effect relationship. And finally, hypertension. Hypertension is a major feature of ectopic fat accumulation. We know that among the different uh, mechanisms by which ectopic fat, visceral fat accumulation promote hypertension is the activation of the renin-angiotensin system. Mm -hmm. And we found that, uh, in fact, the level of angiotensinogen, therefore the activation of the renin-angiotensin system, is linked to aortic valve inflammation and also with uh, the waist circumference. Uh, so therefore I believe that those three factors actually uh, are potentially important key players in the disease process. So you, you have already identified on your radar screen some very interesting potential uh, candidates. But in closing, let's go back to this issue. So therefore, that type of disease is unlikely to be largely LDL concentration driven, right? And this might explain the rather disappointing result from the statin uh, trials regarding the the progression yeah, of the exa stenosis, right? Exactly, Jean-Pierre. I think it's, a, it's not a disease that is uh, uh, predominantly dri driven by LDL uh, cholesterol level, but maybe more by LDL phenotype insulin resistance, um, local uh, renin angiotensin mm -hmm. system, etc. And indeed, uh, initially, uh, there has been some studies, retrospective studies, that have been positive uh, 
uh, in terms of impact of statin in, on progression of autic stenosis. Based on these retrospective studies, um, some randomized trials have been conducted. Uh, essentially, there's been the uh, CIS, the SALTI, and the Astronomer trial. All these three main trials have been negative, absolutely no effect of statin on the progression of autic stenosis. There has been one open label study showing a benefit in those patients who have high LDL cholesterol. So maybe in patients with hypercholesterolemia, so when they have the mm -hmm. risk factor, yeah. uh, or also in patients with really the early stage of the disease, potentially statin may have some modest beneficial effect. But bes beside that, uh, statin obviously have, have no effect. And, and uh, as we just discussed, I mean, what we found uh, may explain why statin failed, because statin has uh, minimal uh, or no effect on the uh, insulin resistance stage, on the uh, LDL phenotype, and on the uh, renin angiotensis system. And interestingly, we, we recently, in the context of the Astronomer trial, we obtained some data showing uh, that not only uh, statin may not uh, help, but they may be potentially harmful in, in some patients. Uh, we found that in patients, in viscerally obese patients, who, have a, who are insulin resistance at baseline and have normal LDL, actually statin are associated with even further reduction in LDL. But mm -hmm. interestingly, uh, the degree of insulin resistance is increased by 25% after one year of treatment, and the uh, LDL uh, particle size is decreasing. So less LDL, but potentially more atherogenic. Mm -hmm. So you, you do some good on one side, but maybe some Warm, uh, uh, some harm on the other side, and finally, uh, the, the, the result is neutral. I guess overall, we know that uh, statins are fantastic uh, cardiovascular drugs, but I guess in this specific disease, we have reached our, our limit, and there's hope from the work that uh, you gentlemen are, are doing that uh, we are going to identify new potentially uh, interesting uh, target. So um, I guess we have learned uh, today that in addition to, again, coronary heart disease and, and type 2 diabetes, valvular disease, and among those, uh, arctic stenosis is certainly uh, a highly prevalent condition with the uh, aging population. Uh, we now know uh, there's clear indication that this is also related to fat stored in the wrong place with a dysmetabolic state. And we certainly uh, do hope that the work conducted by our colleagues here at the Quebec Heart and Lung Institute should pave the way to the development of a new uh, therapeutic approach for the prevention and management of this uh, condition. So, gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for your participation today. Very thank welcome. You,